earth in shadow Restlessly hold Labor's waiting In silent hope For the promise It longs to know what heaven holds Then the angels In holy haste Lift their anthem Your Savior lays In a manger King is born. Hail the Prince of Heaven comes, angel choirs sound the call for this baby wrapped in a cloth is the incarnate word of God. Oh, the King. This means mercy in fullest form, loving kindness forevermore, Son of David and Son of God, He is Christ the Welcome to Grace Collective Online. We are so happy that you are here with us today. And although we wish we were meeting in person, we are so thankful that we are meeting here together online. In a few moments, the worship team will lead us in worship, and then Pastor Rich will bring us the message. God has a purpose for you being here this morning. You're not listening to this by accident. If you're new to Grace Collective and, like, and would like to know a little more about us, we encourage you to text the word COLLECTIVE to 412-467-0533. You'll receive an immediate reply from us asking for some basic contact information so we can share more about who we are as a church in the coming weeks. In a few moments, we'll spend some time singing and worshiping together. And wherever you find yourself, whether it's in your living room with friends and family or sitting in front of your computer screen, Engage this experience in whatever way works best for you. So let's pray together before we get started. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for this time for us to be together online to worship you. May you be praised this morning in every home that has this online experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hey friends, welcome in. We are glad you're joining us. We hope that you are comfortable right where you are. Maybe like you're cuddled up with your kids in your, in your cozy bed. Maybe you're in your fuzzy jammies out at the table getting your Apple Jacks. Maybe you're watching on TV in your den. Uh, we are so thankful that you're joining us from your cozy place uh, here with us in our cozy place. And we're gonna hear the word of God together today. So we're glad you're with us. Let's get started. You know, for the last number of times that we've been meeting together as a body of Christ, we've been talking about how great God is. You know, God is constant and God is faithful. God is true and God is good. And all of those things have very real bearing in your life. They're good for you. Like if God is constant, then you know you can build your life on him. And if God is true, you know you can believe every promise he's given to you. If God is faithful, you know that he's never going to give up on you. And if God is good, man, that's really good. We know that God is great. He's all-powerful, unstoppable, almighty. But can you imagine how scary it would be if God is great but not good? The fact that God is good means he is for you, and that can bring peace into your life. So here we have this great news that God is great. All those things make God great. Or do they? Because what's so great about God being constant if he's not available to you? Or what's so great about his promises if you can't access them? Or what's so great about him being all-powerful if you can't connect to his power? What's so great about God being good if it's not making a difference in your life. Let me explain it like this. I remember a time when I was going trout fishing and I walked right up to the trout stream. I looked at this beautiful water and there were like 30 some trout sitting in the water right in front of me. And I thought, this is great. But do you know that no matter what I threw at them, not a single one would take my bait. So 45 minutes later, I walked away from that great place thinking this isn't so great. I mean, what great is, how great is it seeing all those fish if I can't catch any? Or guys, has this ever happened to you? You fall in love with a girl, but she has no idea that you exist. 
When I was in eighth grade, man, there was this girl. She was beautiful. She, don't, don't judge me. Puppy love is still love to puppies. She was the sweetest girl in the world. At least I think she was. I never actually got brave enough to talk to her. But she was the most beautiful thing God ever created. And I remember her sixth period class was in the same room as my seventh period class. I was never late for seventh period. I got there as fast as I could just to watch her walk out of the room. I'm telling you, I was toast. The sad thing about that whole thing is that I knew I would never have a date with her because she was her and I was me. Feelings like that don't feel so great when you don't get the girl. Friends, listen, sometimes no matter how great things are or seem, they're just not accessible to you. There's a lot of great stuff in life that feels like it's not for you. How great are they really if they're out of your reach? How great is God really if he's out of your reach? How great is, is God if you feel like you're not in his reach? Now, you read about God being good and great and high and mighty and perfect, full of glory, all powerful and unstoppable. Like he can do anything but that is so far out of your reach. You're not like him. He's different from you. There are days for you, you're just happy if you roll out of bed. What's so great about God and all of his greatness if you can't relate to him, if you can't connect to him? Friends, this is exactly why the good news is really, really great news. God knows how much you need him. But he also knows he's way out of your league. He gets that about you. He knows that he's here and you're here. So God decided to do something about it. He decided to come to where you are. And today, what I want you to see is how excited God is to do that for you, but also to see what a difference that makes in your life. It all started with a message that God sent. And I think this begins to show the excitement God had because he could have he could have sent this message any way he wanted to. He could have gotten UPS, FedEx, Prime, but this message merited something more. This message was big. This message was special. So God put his best on it. And on a seemingly quiet night, to a bunch of nobodies out in the middle of a field outside the small town of Bethlehem, this is what happened. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. Follow along if you're able. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now let's get the picture. Bethlehem was a pretty interesting town. It probably would have, it probably would have won best small town USA today. But the fields around Bethlehem were known for two things, raising wheat and raising sheep. Now, the wheat was grown so they could make it into bread. In fact, that's how Bethlehem got its name. Bethlehem in Hebrew means place or city of bread. How cool that the bread of heaven came down and was born in the city of bread. You see what God does. But Bethlehem was also known as the city of David. Because that's where King David, the, the greatest king Israel ever knew, that's where King David was born. That's where King David was raised. In subsequent years, that's where the prophet Samuel came and anointed king as the future king over Israel. Bethlehem was a pretty interesting town. Go back a few generations, even before David, and you find out this is where Rachel, Jacob's wife, was buried. This is where Boaz owned a whole lot of property, a lot of fields. These are the same fields that Ruth gleaned from when she met Boaz, where they fell in love and started their family. And if those names, listen, if those names don't mean anything to you, that's okay. Just know that from their family line, several generations later, Jesus was born in their family tree. Man, a lot of history happened around and in Bethlehem. 
These fields around Bethlehem were also known for their sheep. Shepherds were invited to go into these fields after the harvest to let the sheep pick on the things that were left. And then the sheep did their part by fertilizing the fields for the next season's growth. But these weren't ordinary sheep. The sheep raised around Bethlehem, they were used for temple sacrifices. People would go to the temple and they would buy a lamb to sacrifice for the forgiveness of their sins. That was the covenant that God set up with his people. But only a perfect lamb would do. There were all kinds of qualifiers for these lambs to measure up to sacrifice standard. It had to be a male lamb, one year old, and without spot or blemish, nothing wrong with it at all. These shepherds in the fields that night were watching over these flocks of sheep, trying to raise perfect lambs. And then when the ram, lambs were a year old, they would take them to Jerusalem, which was just five and a half miles due north of Bethlehem. And there they would be sold at the temple for sacrifices. And these, these flocks of sheep, man, they were huge. They had to be vast and cover huge areas because it's estimated that 250 thousand lambs were sacrificed every year at the Passover festival alone. These shepherds were charged with a big responsibility. So here they are out watching over their flocks at night. Verse 9, let's pick it up. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Man, God knows how to make an entrance. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. I want you to hear that word. Let that word resonate in you. Let that word sit in you. In fact, if you're at home right now and you're watching, type the word joy in the chat. Say, I'm here. Joy. Jesus came to give us joy. Type the word joy. Verse 11. Here's why. Here's why the angel said joy comes with their message. Because here is verse 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now, friends, if anything in this whole event made any sense at all to these shepherds, that last line was it. I can picture them dazed and stunned by the brightness of the angel and the others who, who joined that first one. But when the angel gives this message, you will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying to a manger. It snapped them back into reality. They came back to their senses because this was not just an announcement about Jesus' birth. This was a pronouncement about his purpose. God chose these shepherds on purpose because he knew they would get what he was saying. He was speaking their language. That last line spoke volumes to these guys. This is what they did every single day. They would go out when the, when the sheep were giving birth and they would take those lambs, those baby lambs, and they would take them to a place called Miguel Heder. It means the tower of the flock. And they would take those lambs there and they would wrap them in, in cloth strips so that they wouldn't flail about. And then they would lay them in a, in a cut out portion of stone they called the manger. And they would lay those lambs in the manger wrapped in those strips of cloth so when the priests came from Jerusalem, they could examine each of those lambs to see which ones were perfect enough to be sacrificial lambs back at the temple. So when the angel gave this message, it got their attention and they knew exactly what God was talking about. In fact, God's message would have been absolutely unmistakable to these shepherds. Here was the real sacrificial lamb. Here is the one that Jesus, uh, that God was to send. Jesus is referred to in Scripture as the Lamb of God. John the Baptist, do you remember when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. 
With this birth announcement to these shepherds, God's intention was absolutely clear. He announced it to these shepherds who got it. In fact, they got it and they were so excited about it that they immediately ran off from the sheep into town to find this baby that was born. And I wonder if it ever crossed their minds that what they were actually celebrating would be the end of their job security. Because 33 years from then, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, they would not have to have any other perfect lambs sacrificed again. Not for their sins, not for my sins, not for your sins. The perfect lamb, Jesus Christ, was sacrificed once and for all. So here comes God. He's he's speaking the shepherd's language. They're out there guarding these sheep with their lives. But he gives them this message that this is now my Messiah coming for my purpose. I mean, that's great for the shepherds. They understood what, what God was saying. They understood the message. But I'm not a shepherd. And you're probably not a shepherd. So, so where does this amazing God announcement intercept your life? Well, he, here's where. Right at the point where you begin to ask, what's so great about God if he's out of my reach, if he's out of my league? What's so great about all these great things about God if I can't have them? Friends, God's announcement to the shepherd about Jesus being born is his announcement to you saying he just entered your league. Listen, Jesus' birth made God accessible. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, wasn't God like always accessible? God was always available, but there's a difference between being available and being accessible. That girl from my eighth grade class, she was available, but to me, she was not accessible. Maybe you understand it like this. You drive past that expensive car lot, every one of those expensive cars are available, but your checkbook says they're not accessible to you. Or you walk past a bakery that that has that window filled with all those amazing looking desserts, every single one of those is available, but your doctor said they're not accessible to you. See, there's a difference between being available and being accessible. Available says, here I am for you. And accessible says, I've made a way for you to come to me. Jesus came to make God accessible. God just gave access to himself, to you, and to everyone, everywhere, every day. Type that in the chat. Everyone, everywhere, every day. So what does any of this have to do with joy? Like, Why would the angels say that their message of Jesus being born will cause great joy? Here's, here's why. Don't miss this. Through Jesus, you now have access to God, which means you have access to all those great things about him. And the moment you begin to access God, he begins to access you and pour his greatness into you, to pour him being constant, to pour him being faithful, to pour him being true, to pour him being good right into you. And to demonstrate how that brings joy, I'm going to contrast two things for you, happiness and joy. You know, people say, You can't buy happiness. Are you kidding me? Have you never been present on a Christmas morning when kids come running down and and they begin to just rip the packages open when they begin to tear off the paper and squeal with joy and dance around the room? I'll never forget one of my favorite Christmas gifts. I, I ran down the stairs, I looked under the tree, and there was the weirdest shaped present under the tree, wrapped, and with my name on it. And when it was time for us to begin unwrapping the gifts, 
I mean, I was like five years old. I just tore it open. And I didn't even ask for this thing, but I was so happy. It was a full-sized red plastic six-string guitar. Man, there was, there was no tuning and there was no harmony in those strings, but I was so happy. In fact, I was so happy. As soon as we were done opening our gifts, I put on my winter jacket. I pulled on my winter boots. I ran through the snow with my new guitar to my best friend's house next door. I wanted to show him and his family how happy I was with my new gift. I knocked on the door and Mrs. Smith opened the door. And the moment she did, I just stood there playing my guitar, singing a song. It wasn't pretty. I didn't, I didn't know a lick about playing a guitar. I was just playing a happy song. She didn't invite me in. It didn't go so well. But friends, you tell me money doesn't buy happiness? Man, have you been sleeping through Christmas mornings? Or, or how about you? Didn't you spend money to go on a vacation sometime? Didn't you spend money to go away somewhere else, to see family, to visit with friends, to be with your family, to be happy? Or, or I'll tell you this, go spend some money and take your kids to Kennywood for one day. And I guarantee you, at the end of that day, they're going to be tired, but they're going to be happy. It doesn't even have to be that elaborate. Take me to Chick-fil-A. Buy me some waffle fries. I will be happy. Has this ever happened to you? You get hungry for Chick-fil-A? So you get in the car, you start driving to Chick-fil-A, you're smiling, you're humming a happy song because you're happy, you're, you're thinking about that spicy chicken sandwich and you pull into the park, you're not so happy until you realize it's Sunday. It's Sunday and they're closed on Sunday. You go from happy to being unhappy. You tell me money can't buy happiness, I don't buy that. Listen, it's okay that that money buys happiness to some extent. That's okay. That's not the problem. The problem is that for a lot of us, we've mistaken happiness for joy. And here's why this is a problem. Happiness is sourced from the outside. Happiness depends on your circumstances, what's happening around you and what's happening to you. The problem with that is that your circumstances change and the sources run out. So happiness doesn't last. This is one of the reasons COVID has been taking such a big toll on us. COVID cancels your vacation plans. COVID changes the way you, you interact with your extended family and your, and your friends. COVID cancels out the opportunity you have to go do things that make you happy. It's changing your circumstances. It's eliminating some of the things that you can control at times to make you happy. And when those things are taken away or stripped away from you, you are left feeling sad and depressed and angry and maybe even lonely. You're unhappy. So in response to that, you seek those things more. You extend more energy into that. You spend more money on things. You desire them more strongly. You play more hours on that game. You watch more of your favorite Netflix. You eat more food. You go to unhealthy measures to try and get to get a semblance of that happiness back. But can you imagine can you imagine not having to do that? Can you imagine for a moment what it would be like to hold on to something that's sort of like happiness, but is deeper and stronger? Something that doesn't change with your circumstances. Well, friends, welcome to joy. Joy doesn't rely on anything from the outside. Listen, joy is something God builds on your inside. When Jesus came, he made God accessible to you. This is why Jesus said, now you can knock and it's going to be, the door will be opened. Ask and you'll receive. Jesus was very clear. He said, hey, just access God and he's going to access you. Jesus put all the greatness of God within your reach. You have unlimited access to God. It never ends. And when you access him, he pours all of those great things about himself back into you. you know, his hope, his peace, his power, his strength, all those things go back into you and they begin to form a foundation for joy to be built in you. 
And it doesn't matter what's happening outside of you. God is doing this inside of you. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. Listen, your job can go away. Your car can break down. Your relationships can blow up. You, you can even, you can even uh, find that uh, your vacation gets canceled. Those, those are painful. I'm going to say they're not sad. But when you access God and He builds joy into you, that joy stands even when all those other external things fall. You know, it's interesting to me that when you read the Scriptures, the idea of joy so often is connected to things that don't make us happy. Like Paul writes, hey, in the midst of sorrow, still rejoice. And James The brother of Jesus said, count it all joy when you face trials of many kinds. I'm like, that doesn't sound very happy to me. It's not about happy. It's about joy. Joy is deeper. Joy is more pure. Joy is strong. Joy uh, uh, is, is not affected by the outside things around you. When God builds his joy in you, it lasts. Can you imagine having a sense of joy about you, even when life is hard, even when life is uncertain, even when life is scary? You can have that. And here's how. You simply say, God, here I am. You've given me access to you, so I'm going to take advantage of it. And I'm giving you access to me. God, I need you. I'm not worth much. God, I know I'm worth way less than much. But here I am. And God, here you are. Will you build your joy in me? And God is like, this is why I came. This is why the angels gave the message they gave. I I scripted it for them. Hey, there's going to be this thing I'm doing. It's going to cause great joy. I'm coming in person so you can access me. I am, I'm going to build joy into you. Friends, what's so great about God? He came in person on a quiet, silent night 2,000 years ago in the fields outside a little nowhere town to a bunch of shepherds who would understand what he was telling them. The joy that it brought to them is the same joy that's available to you. The message again went like this. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. For today in the town of David, in Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Pray with me. So Jesus, here we are today and God, I don't know where everybody is, but I know that there's part of every one of our lives that's not very happy. God, there are things going on around us and there are things um, happening to us that don't feel happy. But God, would you teach us to take our eyes from the external and place them on you? Would you allow us, Lord God, to permit you to work internally on us, that you would be pouring into us all those great things about you? And as you do that, Jesus, those become the very strong foundation upon which you will build your joy in us. God, I pray for people who are watching and listening wherever they are online right now, that if they are lacking joy in their life, they would take the moment to bend their knee or lift their head or just say out loud to you, Jesus, I need you because I need your joy. And I pray that you would pour into them a joy so abundant and so powerful and so real that they would never, never, never doubt that it has been placed in them as a gift from you, Holy Spirit. So God, come and do your work. We need you to so desperately. God, thank you. And may our joy become contagious in the lives of others. Jesus, we pray this from the joy that comes from your name today and every day. Amen. Well, friends, what do you say we celebrate in some joy? Let's give God some glory as we turn our hearts back into worship. Friends, this is the time we are inviting you to partner with us in giving. Since we are not able to meet together in person, we encourage you to give online. And we want to thank you for 
continuing to give generously as you are able. I want you to know that your giving is making a huge impact. Since the last time we met, over 500 people tuned in and had the chance to hear the message of Jesus, the message of peace that we are able to share online. That's absolutely awesome. And even during this time, we continue to help so many families right here in our community through our outreach ministries. Families who have very real needs during this time. That's all possible because of your giving. And I want to encourage you to continue to give, to continue to be faithful and to offer back to God out of your resources as you can. And yes, that does look a little different right now. All you have to do is jump on our website, gracecollectivechurch.com slash give, or use one of the other two options you see on the screen.
Our God really does bring joy. He is making a way in every dark place even now, even when things feel chaotic, uncertain, or out of control. 
because of Jesus, you can still have joy. Let's keep our focus on Him. If prayer would be helpful to you, please send us your prayer request by going to gracecollectivechurch.com slash pray. That way, members of our prayer team can be praying with you and for you during this season. And if you're new, I want to invite you to text the word collective to 412-467-0533. We would love to connect with you and follow up with you so we can better serve you. And lastly, I'd like to encourage you to follow us on all social media throughout the week for encouraging content so that we can keep this conversation going all week long. Thank you so much for joining us today.